Dr. James Ray is a professor in the School of Interactive Computing at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where he is also co-director of the Computational Perception Lab and director of the Center for Behavioral Imaging. He also serves as the deputy director of the NIH Center of Excellence for Mobile Sensor Data to Knowledge, or MD2K. Today, Dr. Ray will give us an introduction to first-person vision, which will be followed up in two weeks on August 20th with a more in-depth look at this topic. Welcome, Dr. Ray. Great. Thank you so much. Let me just get my timer set up here. All right. So this is our first uh, uh, of these meetings in more of a tutorial style, and my goal here is to uh, essentially provide you some background on an area of computer vision, which is currently very exciting in terms of the at level of activity and the interest, and also one which I think is very relevant to the MD2K effort. And this is the area of what's called first-person vision. So I'm going to kind of take you through what first-person vision is all about, but I'm going to also along the way give you a kind of introduction to computer vision, which is really the kind of parent discipline, if you will, in which this new field has been uh, has come to life. And really, the impetus for this is this unique opportunity that we have to outfit people with a variety of cameras. So people increasingly are wearing cameras and collecting video uh, throughout their daily life. And, and really, one of the main points of this talk is that that video that one captures from wearable cameras is, in some fundamental ways, very different from the kinds of video that we've worked with in the past, both in terms of its computational challenges and in terms of the kind of information that one can extract from it. And so that's really kind of the goal of this field, actually, is to really understand what is the value of this type of new video and what can we actually do with it. And so if you kind of think about what are the applications where a wearable camera might be interesting, you can easily generate a fairly long list. And you can see some examples here of some different applications. One that I want to focus on in particular for MD2K is this ability to understand a person's visual environment and characterize the types of visual inputs they're receiving throughout their daily life. And we know that people respond uh, in very strong ways to the visual stimuli that they receive, but we have a very difficult time to really assess that stimuli under natural conditions in sort of day-to-day -day life until now, until today. And that's really one of the exciting promises of this area. So I want to start by giving you just a sense of what some of the, if you will, the building blocks or the, or the research questions might be uh, around exploiting a video from a worn camera. In this case, the person in the picture is wearing pivot head. It's a pair of glasses uh, with a camera mounted in the bridge of the nose. So it gives you a sense of what the person sees from their eye level as they go about their, their daily life. And you can think about a variety of questions you might ask about this person's uh, visual experiences. So you might ask, where are they located? Not just the GPS coordinate, but what is the nature of their environment? What type of environment or place are they currently in? So you might answer that as saying they're outdoors, they're at the beach. You might wonder, how did they get there? And again, you might want a level of detail which is greater than uh, just the GPS trace. You might want to know, are they going uphill? Are they going downhill? What is, the, what is the material they're walking on? Is it sand? Is it concrete? So there's a lot of rich information about their movement through the environment, their locomotion, that one can extract, as it turns out, from these kinds of videos. And we'll talk about how to do all these things in, in, in this talk. Uh, you might also wonder what they can see. So in this environment that they're in, what exactly is their kind of current set of visual inputs? So maybe they can see a beach scene with some friends. And that's the information you get from this camera, which is located essentially right at level of your eye. So it can see with some limitations and some caveats uh, what your eye can see. Okay? And, but you might ask a more detailed question. You might ask, within this scene that's available to them, this, this uh, scene that they can see, you might ask, where are they actually attending? What is the actual location that they're attending or they're fixating uh, with their eyes? So maybe they're looking at some advertising. Um, so these are all sets of questions that you might want to answer that one can address with this new kind of sensor platform. And finally, you might ask, what are they doing? So in this environment, with these visual inputs, what is the person actually doing? What is their activity? And so you might answer, for example, well, they're making a sandwich. And it turns out in our lab, we make lots of sandwiches as part of this, this research. All right, so, so these are some uh, kind of, if you will, very basic questions that one might try to answer using this kind of visual input. Visual input, that there are certain people, for example, in this environment. And then there's this eye tracking technology, which is 
exists essentially independently of computer vision, but actually can be informed a lot by computer vision thinking, which gives us this more detailed picture of perception. And then lastly, this question of what are they doing really has two parts. So there's the, the verb, if you will, the action being performed, in this case, making something. And then there's the noun, the object, making this thing called a sandwich. So all of these are some basic computer vision technologies that are very relevant in this first-person vision context. And in this talk, I want to give you an introduction to these technologies um, and how they, how they function in the context of this first-person vision scenario. And then in my next talk, we'll dive a little deeper and talk about even more uh, kind of fundamental aspects of first-person vision. So this is the outline. I'm going to give you a basic introduction to computer vision. I want to give you um, a chance to look at these sort of three main areas of object recognition, looking at camera and image motion, um, and looking at how to recognize actions. So we'll start with computer vision. So I want to give you a sense of what is kind of the state of this field. There's some very basic things we need to talk about as far as how cameras produce uh, images. And then we need to talk about these embedded cameras that are really driving the market right now and are present in all those devices that I was showing. So the one thing about vision that's hard to understand is that it's a really hard problem. And this is hard because as humans, we're expert computer vision machines. And the expertise we have is not available to us as introspe introspectively. And so here's an example that just shows you, illustrates, if you will, the complexity of the human visual processing, which is completely invisible to us. So the amazing thing about this picture is that if you look at it carefully, you'll notice that essentially um, this square right here, with my, where my mouse is, and this square right here are in fact exactly the same color. In other words, the intensity of light, how bright it is in these two patches is exactly the same. Now, this, this means if I open the image in Photoshop and look at those pixel values, they're exactly the same. Now, people often have a hard time believing that, and so you can sort of improve their ability to tell by putting these little windows around those squares. That doesn't always work. You can essentially animate so the squares kind of move into each other like that. That usually makes it more clear. And then finally, if you put a boundary around the whole unit, then people can usually realize that, yes, in fact, those two squares are exactly the same color. So the point of this example is that your brain is doing an incredibly complicated task when it's just accessing the brightness of a square of pixels in the scene. So the pixel brightness, the color, the intensity is, is mapped to your perception of that scene in a very complicated way that has nothing to do with the overall brightness or some very simple statistic. And this, in turn, is the capability we need to build into our programs to really solve this problem. So this is kind of a fundamentally hard problem in terms of understanding the ambiguities that are there in collections of pixels. The other dimension of this challenge has to do with the information that is lost in the imaging process. So this is a person sitting in a room looking at a variety of objects, and of course the image that person sees looks like the one on the right. And so you've lost this depth information, you've mapped the 3D scene into a 2D image, and you've lost the ability to, to see directly a variety of things. In particular, you can't see the angles anymore. The room actually consists of 90 degree angles, but in the image, the angles you see, uh, many of them are not 90 degrees, even though they are actually the, in 90 degrees in 3D. You've also lost all the distances. You can't tell how far away things are anymore. And this is a source of ambiguity. So that light in the ceiling could be the light you see here in this, in this side view of the scene, or it also could equally be a light that's just a little bit farther away and slightly larger. And that larger, farther away light would produce exactly the same projection into the image. So basic quantities like how big is an object are actually lost in this imaging process. And your brain, amazingly enough, can recover those quantities through a very complex analysis of these pixel values. So these are some very kind of fundamental problems, and, and these problems are, as far as we can tell today, uh, very hard and probably likely to remain unsolved in a general form uh, for some time. But, um, but fortunately, we can actually drill down and, and frame some more specific problems where we can get some traction. And that's what's happened in the last 15 years of computer vision. We've made tremendous progress. Really, it's the, the, the best time to be in this field since it's existed, I think. And a lot of the progress has come from leveraging large amounts of data using powerful machine learning methods. Um, just a few examples of the successes. So there are simple classes of objects like, objects like faces, for example, that now have become kind of commodity technologies. So you can build a face detector into a camera as a routine thing. Uh, social media sites are routinely tagging faces and doing sort of better and better at that task. Um, there are some recent experiments that, that you know, suggest that on a small number of categories, a thousand categories of objects, machines are doing as well as people. Um, that should be taken with a grain of salt, but it's an interesting kind of landmark or, or milestone as to where we are. And then lastly, our ability to do this 3D reconstruction, recover this missing dimension, has also been improving a lot in the same period of time. So both in terms of recognition, under, understanding the meaning of an image, and in terms of the geometry of the scene, both of those dimensions have made tremendous progress. So let's talk about some of the basic things that we need to kind of conceptualize in order to 
look at some of these solutions and how this field has progressed. So the most basic thing is a camera model. You probably have seen this before, but I just want to get it up here for you to take a look at. So the basic thing the camera does, of course, is it focuses light from the scene, collected from this object, the Christmas tree, onto a plane, which is the imaging plane. That produces this 2D image of the scene that then needs to be analyzed. And uh, obviously you can have camera parameters that need to be changed, and those parameters affect how this image is formed. And so one of the most basic things you need to do in computer vision is model your camera. And I just want to give you a sense of the kind of model here. The details are not super important for the stuff that follows, but I want to give you a little bit of a sense. So just get the basic thing on the board here. So uh, the basic idea is you do this kind of projection, if you will, from 3D to 2D. Um, you map a pixel out in the scene with XYZ coordinates to a pixel in, in this image plane. And you notice that the pixel in the image plane has a depth, which is the, essentially the focal length of the camera. Um, and this is the, set the same for all the points, and so you've now lost the third dimension here. Um, and then really the important point of this is that there's this parameter con controlling how far away the image plane is. That's called the focal length. That's a kind of key, what's called an intrinsic parameter of your camera that needs to be calibrated in general. And then once you have that, that parameter, then there's a very simple nonlinear mapping that takes you from 3D to 2D. So this simple equation down here is the kind of the heart of computer vision in terms of the geometry. It tells you how a pixel out in the scene is going to get mapped to a pixel, in, in, how a point out in the scene is going to get mapped to a pixel in the image. And this, it's a nonlinear mapping, as you can see, varying with depth. All right, so let's just look at the focal length for a second. So you can think of this as the amount of zoom. Here's an image of the same scene taken with, taken with different focal lengths. So this is an important parameter of the camera model, and it needs to be calibrated, as I said, if you're going to recover the geometry of the scene. Okay, and there are a lot of ways to do this. Um, now let's talk about how we can embed the camera in the scene and understand sort of where it is and how it's going to capture that image. So here's a scene of interest. And the way we do this, the machinery we use, is uh, coordinate systems from basic kind of Euclidean geometry. So there's a coordinate system centered somewhere on the object. It's got our three axes, of course. There's a camera out on the scene, and we need to describe where is that camera in the object coordinate system. So we give the camera a center of projection, an origin, and its own axes. And now we can take uh, that camera coordinate system and relate it uh, to, the, to the scene. So we can take a point on the scene, like the chimney stack here, and then we can ask, how does that point map back into the camera coordinate system, and therefore, how is it formed into an image using that model that I showed you earlier? And so there's a, a set of parameters known as the extrinsics, which is the rotation and the translation of the camera, six degrees of freedom, that describe how the camera and the scene are related geometrically. So the overall model is actually, there's a little bit of math that makes it slightly more complicated, but it's actually relatively straightforward. So there's sort of three parts. There's the intrinsic part, which is usually in the, in, in the simplest case is just one parameter. And then there's these two other quantities, the rotation and the translation. And there's a giant matrix that, that puts this all together. Okay, so, so there's some math around homogeneous coordinates and, and, and projective geometry that you need to kind of get the details down. But, but the basic process is a relatively simple, just a matrix model of how this camera uh, produces an image. And here you can see an example of a, of a camera out in, the, out in the world somewhere. And in one position, it captures an image of a point in the scene. So there's this uh, point Q in the scene. We get an image of it. That's the, the pi Q there. This, this is the projection matrix that I showed you earlier. And now we move the camera to a new position, and we can capture an image of the same point. And now we get a new point in the new image. And so you can think of this then as a way to sort of understand how you might organize this data and perhaps recover some of the geometry. And we'll talk more about the details of this piece, actually, in my next lecture. But, but the basic idea is the camera is going to move. The camera is going to image the scene from a variety of positions. And we're going to be able to sort of figure out that these two points in, in these two different image locations, pi, uh, pi 2 of Q and pi 1 of Q, actually correspond to the same point in the scene. And so then there's some very basic uh, things people can have done uh, with this starting point. So here's an example of a, of a very nice piece of work from Noah Snavely's group uh, at Cornell. Um, these are a set of photos taken from, from the Colosseum in Rome. And what you see in the right uh, uh, corner is actually a 3D reconstruction of that Colosseum as a point cloud. And all the little triangles you see in that image are different uh, estimations of camera locations. All the people who took photos of that Colosseum and uploaded their photos to Flickr, all their camera positions have been solved for in, the, in a giant optimization problem. And you can see their localization in 3D space. So this is a very powerful tool for reasoning about the geometry of the imaging process. Okay? And this is now becoming, as I said, a fairly mature technology. All right, so I wanted to show you one example of how this might work a little bit closer to home. This is actually a video taken from a car. And this is actually the thing that's kind of driving this field right now in terms of the 3D, 
is autonomous driving applications where you're moving through the scene from some vehicle and capturing a sequence of images. You can see them here as a video. And then what my student Abhijit Kundu has done in some, since some related work here is he's found a way to reconstruct the 3D environment, in this case as a voxel-based model. And you can just kind of see the geometry of the scene here and the, and the various uh, mappings of color onto those voxels based on the type of scene element that it is, whether it's a road or a sidewalk or what have you. Um, and this is all being done in a, in a very complicated pipeline that takes the video input and produces this representation as an output. So, uh, so this is a technology that's not maybe quite ready to be used broadly for, for first-person vision, but it's definitely getting there. And I'll show some examples uh, based on this going a little further uh, in my next lecture. All right, so this was uh, kind of giving us a sense of how images are formed geometrically and how you might inverse, in, invert in some way that geometry to get access to the underlying 3D scene. And I want to now briefly talk about uh, the sensors that we're going to use in practice uh, to do this kind of work. So this is a, a graphic that shows the kind of conventional digital camera market over the last, uh, you know, I don't know, 40 years. And you can see a steady and healthy growth in the sale of digital cameras of a variety of types. But there's one type of camera that's missing from this graph, and that's the cameras that are in your smartphones. And so the smartphone cameras are the orange, and you can see that there's a tremendous amount, additional tremendous amount of those smartphone cameras. How many more smartphone cameras actually are there? Well, to see that, you've got to back this graph out quite a bit. So that's the actual graph of the smartphone cameras. And in fact, in, in 2014, I think it was 1.2 billion of these cameras uh, being sold in the, around the world. So, so we are awash in embedded cameras, and they're all being driven by this smartphone kind of mobile market. And that has very important consequences for the work we do because it dictates the type of technology that's going to be available for us to use. And that technology, for the most part, is uh, what are known as CMOS cameras. And you can see uh, some products here, like the iPhone, that uses that type of imager and has been a big driver. Um, and these cameras are not perfect from a vision standpoint. They have more noise than a kind of high-quality SLR camera, but they consume a lot less power. And as a result, they're a huge market driver. And because they're such a huge driver, they're getting better all the time. And uh, moreover, our techniques for dealing with their problems, because they do have some problems that I'll show you, those techniques are also getting better all the time. So here, let's look at a few things that, that go wrong with these cameras, and I'll actually show a few more examples of these next time. But one thing is this rolling shutter artifact. The helicopter uh, has blades that are actually straight, but in the image they seem to be curved, and they're curved because the image is actually being taken uh, at different points in time. So rather than being taken all at once as a chunk, it's actually taken some kind of row by row, and because of that, when things move fast, you get what are called these tearing artifacts, where the geometry appears to be distorted by the camera's uh, essentially uh, kind of an inexpensive way of handling the pixels. So fortunately, this has been studied a lot now, and there's some techniques that we can talk about for handling this. Another thing that's, that's very difficult to handle or happens in general is the blooming. When you're looking at the sun or a light source, you get this huge kind of bleed over in terms of the intensities of light. Again, people work on this, but it, this is actually a harder problem to handle uh, from a cost standpoint. Um, and then there are all kinds of distortions, and you'll see these distortions uh, later on in the, in the talk, actually. Um, but the good news is that if you're really meticulous and careful about calibration, you, you can actually handle these fairly well. So this is one of the things we can actually handle pretty well, and you can see a beautiful example of that uh, here. So, so we'll talk a bit more about some of these artifacts when we go a little deeper in first-person vision next time. But I just want to make you aware that there are these problems that arise in kind of taking these images and then extracting even some basic information about geometry from them. Okay, that's, so that's, that's where we are. So let's review where we've come so far. So this has been a basic review of computer vision. Um, I've talked about how to model in a quick sort of way the geometry of the imaging. Um, I've mentioned that we have this ability now to infer where cameras are in space and recover something about the 3D structure of the environment that they're in and that this is all being driven by this tremendous explosion of CMOS imagers essentially all around the world. So I want to now sort of build on this and move on and talk about how we can use these types of images that I showed you to solve a variety of problems. And I'm going to focus mainly on uh, recognizing objects, and I'm also going to talk about how you can infer information about the motion of the camera in the scene and the motion of the scene itself relative to the camera, and that's going to give us some tools to look at action recognition which is one of the basic uh, kind of questions that we posed earlier in the talk that would be a driver for our, for our work. So the next thing is to talk about object detection, which is a very basic capability of understanding what objects are present in a person's visual environment or visual scene. And this really has a couple of consequences for us. So there's a question of uh, how can we think about using objects in various tasks we care about, like activity recognition, 
um, what are some of the basic methods for doing object detection, and then if you do them in certain first-person vision settings, like I'll be talking a lot about activities of daily living, then how well do they work? Okay, and, and actually we'll talk more about this in the next lecture, but this will give you some basic background for some kind of very basic feature like how to work with objects. So here's a data set that was collected by uh, Pierce, Evish, and Ramanan in the UC Irvine a couple of years ago, and they put a GoPro on a person's chest, as you can see here, the person in the orange jacket, and then they essentially went around the house and performed a variety of uh, kind of daily activities. In this case, they're washing dishes, and they went in and basically annotated these images with, with lots of information about the objects. You can see all the objects in this, in this kitchen that are significant, everything from the soap liquid to the brush to the dish itself um, are all labeled. And these labels are provided by a human, and that's actually very important. So a lot of the strides we've made in this field over the past you know, 15 years have come from the ability to access large amounts of hand-labeled data from humans that give you this information, crucial information about the meaning of those sets of pixels. So this is a crucial piece of information to have. And then the question is, how can we take this type of input, like this image you see, and then extract those images, those objects automatically? So given just the image without the labels, how can we detect those objects, and then how can we utilize that information to actually uh, solve various problems? So here's an example of what that looks like as a video. Um, this is the uh, one sequence from inside the home. You can actually see some tearing artifacts if you look carefully due to the CMOS imager. Um, you can see this person is kind of attempting to have kind of a natural, uh, you know, uh, time in their kitchen here, going to pour themselves some juice. Um, and so then the question is, you know, how could we analyze this type of video, find all the relevant objects like that cup there, um, and maybe the juice uh, thing container as well, and then that gradually deduce that this person was pouring some juice, maybe they opened the fridge, they got the juice out, they poured it, put it back, et cetera. Okay, so this is the goal. Um, so the first thing you've got to do is decide what are the actions you care about, and that in turn will tell you what the objects are that you should annotate. And the way they approached this problem was to kind of look at some literature on, on scenarios where patients are asked to kind of track their activities of daily living when they may have lost some functionality, and they made a kind of taxonomy, if you will, of 18 categories of different activities that seem to be important. And I would say there's nothing here that's extremely um, you know, uh, uh, a principle in the sense that there wasn't really an application here, there wasn't really a person that they were using this to work with necessarily, um, but, but this was maybe a reasonable first pass uh, as a way to get started with this problem from a computer science point of view, okay? And I think that's one of the interesting things to talk about in MD2K is the, is the gap between the data sets that computer scientists make up when they want to solve problems versus the data sets you need to have to actually have an impact in the area of health. So I'm sure we'll see, have lots of discussion about that uh, going forward. So let's now talk about, assuming for the moment that that taxonomy seems reasonable to you and those objects seem, seem important, let's talk about how we could actually detect them. And at this point, there's a fairly mature approach, which is this pipeline you see here. And, and I'm showing you how this works first as a, as a tool that's, a, that, that's been, been trained. So this is what's called the testing phase when the classifier is ready for use and you're deploying it in the world. And what you're going to do is you're going to essentially scan an image like the one you see here on the left with all kinds of windows of different sizes. And each window position in the image is essentially a query. You're asking, is there an object in that location of, 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 of the type that I care about? So in this case, we assume I care about cows. We've scanned that particular location you see there in red. In fact, we know by, through our eyes there is a cow there. And then the question is whether the algorithm can figure out that too. And the way it's going to do is it's going to apply a classifier, uh, that's a machine learning decision rule, that's going to look at all those pixels and then assign the label, hopefully, cow. Okay, and then if it does that, it's done a good job and we're happy. Now, that is only possible because we have, as I mentioned, lots and lots of examples of images that have been labeled by people, these two big databases you see at the bottom, and we go through a very laborious process that takes a lot of time and computation to do what's called classifier learning, to learn the classifier that's going to be applied to that window to get the good performance. And when the classifier has finally been trained, then we pass it out and install it in the application, in the smartphone, or what have you, and now we have a deployable object classifier we can use for a variety of applications. Okay, so everything hinges on how you actually set up your data set and how you train the classifier, which in turn means that this box called window classifier needs to be spec specified with a lot more structure. And here's the typical uh, form of that box. It's got a stage which is called feature calculation where you take the image that are just pixels, and as we saw, pixels are sort of really hard to get meaning from. They vary in all kinds of complicated ways that don't really uh, have any meaning in terms of the underlying uh, property of the scene. And so we try to map those features to a high dimensional feature space and at this point in time, tens of millions of features uh, for a single patch is very common. Um, and then once we have a high-dimensional feature space that hopefully encapture, encapsulates 
the important information better, then we can apply that feature uh, input to our classifiers. And then what we hope is that the classifier for cow, which is the one on the top there, has a very high score. And all the classifiers for other objects of interest, like dog, for example, have a low score. And this is known as a one versus all approach to what's called multi-class classification, where you've got multiple labels that you're trying to classify. Okay, so this is really kind of the state of the art right now. And the only thing that has changed in the last few years is the answer to these two questions. And the question is, what is the feature space? How do we design that high dimensional box in the middle of the slide? And in the past, the answer was, well, you know, expert computer vision researchers have figured out through laborious work and some theoretical uh, exercises what the right features are, and we use these manually designed features that are actually quite good. And now we've learned recently is that, in fact, if you allow uh, a learning machine to actually learn the features as well, you can get better performance. And we've actually known this for a long time, but only recently has the data and the methods been available to really uh, kind of explore this approach on a large scale. And the, the ability to do that has had a big consequence for computer vision. Uh, everything has basically changed because of these deep models in terms of the details. Um, a lot of the high-level stuff is still the same. So I'm going to show you in a few more slides how the old kind of, if you will, pre-deep learning world worked. Um, and, and that's actually in some ways beneficial to you because those features you can actually understand what they're doing. Uh, the learn features are actually, actually very hard to understand um, sometimes. Um, but just keep in mind that if you really want the highest accuracy, then the techniques I'm going to tell you about now are not, not actually state of the art anymore. And you actually have to go to these deep models in order to get the highest accuracy. All right, so then uh, the features are going to be learned in, in, in the, our modern world. And then the answer to the classification rule used to be a very uh, kind of mature and very easy to use technology called sport vector machine. And the latent version of that is the one in vision that turns out to be the best and, and very important. But again, if you're willing to use models that are more complicated and spend a lot more time training them, then you can actually do a much better job. And so the deep models have taken over uh, this space as well. All right, so let's talk, but let's just roll the clock back a few years. Let's not talk about deep models. Um, and that let's just get some intuition, if you will, for what features might be good to use if one's goal is to take an image like this one and detect all the circles. And so one feature which was invented in 2005 by Dalal and Triggs is called the hog feature. Um, and it's actually quite intuitive. What it says is that you should take the image, you should extract the image gradients. And the gradient, of course, is just the change in a function in a, in a spatial direction. In this case, you think of the image itself as actually a function. And then that image as a function has various gradients, and those gradients align with the edges in the scene, the place where there's some high contrast. So you can see all these circles produce little uh, rings of, of little oriented edges, and those are, in fact, the, the gradient features, the hog features. And then one of the things we learned is the importance of doing things over scale, so doing things at multiple spatial resolutions because objects exist at different sizes because of the very basic nature of the imaging model, this perspective camera model. And so what you do to build a hog feature vector is you calculate the gradients, you sample them over some grid of, of, of locations in the image, you normalize them in a blockwise fashion and do it at multiple scales. And that gives you a giant feature vector that you can then use uh, to perform classification. And so for a kind of very typical problem that was solved in, in the mid-2000s of finding upright people, this was called person detection, but really it means people that are standing upright like a pedestrian and look like the man in the picture there. And then what you get in that case is a single hog template, so a single, single gradient model for, for that kind of person. And you can see a rendering of it there as a little window. Um, and then you can look at what that does uh, in terms of classification. So on the left at the bottom is the actually just the average image, which shows you kind of average gradient image. It shows you where the gradients are organized. You can see kind of a ghostly figure. And then it's actually hard at the resolution of these uh, weight images, the, the two ones on the right. But if you can kind of squint and blur them a bit, you'll see that they look kind of like an upright person. And that's telling you that the, late, that the weights in the SVM have learned to emphasize those features that are the most salient for finding people in images. So this is a great result. It gave us the first working person detector. Um, it actually was useful for certain applications. Um, and it also was very kind of intuitive and easy to understand why it might be working. However, um, a simple model like that's not really good enough for uh, all the objects of interest in the world. And one problem is that a lot of objects have parts that move around. So pe people really don't stand upright all the time like that. They uh, often move their arms and their legs, and they assume different poses. Um, faces may be sort of compact in one sense, but they, are, they often move and change expression and articulate in very complicated ways. And many other objects have moving parts, or they, in, their, in their viewpoint change, their appearance is so, so radically different that it actually is better to model those as sort of different aspects of the same object rather than trying to do with one model. So for all these reasons, we, we ultimately realized we needed models with more flexibility in, in how 
the appearance of the object is actually described. And the person that really kind of pointed the way towards this most effectively is Peter Felsenswab, who's at Brown now. Um, and this is some work that he did with his collaborators uh, on what are called deformable part models. And prior to the deep learning revolution, these were the state of the art uh, techniques for doing object detection in images. And you can see the basic idea is actually very simple. So rather than having one template, one little window for a target of interest like this mountain bike here, you're instead going to have a collection of windows um, which are trying to describe kind of localized parts, localized pieces of this object that have some kind of distinctive appearance. And the nice thing about this framework is that the, um, the details of how many parts to use and what appearance models to use for each part, like what gradients should each part consist of, um, and where the parts should be positioned relative to each other, all those details were handled by a fully automatic procedure. So given just the images containing the objects, and maybe some rough information about where the object's localized, and maybe some more details about that if you want, then you can push a button and essentially train a model that does a pretty good job of recognizing these kind of objects. And again, if you look into the gradient map here, you can see, if you squint a little bit, you can kind of see the outline of a bike. There's the wheel, two wheels here, there's the seat, there's the kind of handlebar up here. And these are really modeled by a collection of these templates that are automatically kind of learned and then configured uh, appropriately. So this was, again, a big breakthrough for our field uh, in having the first kind of practical object detection system that worked for things other than faces and people. So uh, one last detail I didn't mention is the learning method. And I mentioned already that it's a support vector machine. I don't think I have the time today to really uh, talk about how that support vector machine works, but it's a very basic piece of machine learning technology these days. And if you look online, you can find many tutorials about them, and you probably have them in your classes as well. Um, and the only thing that really is different here is that one support vector machine, in some sense, is not really enough either, because one template is not really enough. And so it turns out that the best thing to do is to have what's called a latent support vector machine. And latent just means that there's some variables that are hidden that you can't measure directly that need to be inferred as part of the training process. And then and they also need to be inferred when you're processing an image. And in this case, the latent piece is actually just the locations of those little parts, where they're con how they're configured in the image to cover the object. That part doesn't need to be fully specified at training time. And then what you can think about this as doing is it's kind of clustering uh, kind of examples into groups and then finding classifiers that work for specific groups of examples. Um, and that's the way to kind of uh, find the structure and the data and exploit it. All right, so that's the classification piece. And I'll just show you some models, a bit more detail. So here's the bicycle model. And you can see that we get several different models here. So there's kind of a side model where you, that I showed you earlier where the bicycle is from the side. And notice that the side template here is actually the bike in its, uh, in its configuration with both wheels on the road. But the same model is actually able to detect the bike when the guy's doing a wheelie because, of course, you can shift those parts up a little bit and then get them in the right configuration for the wheelie bike. And that works pretty well also. And then because the viewpoint change has such a huge role, the bike from the front really looks very different than the bike from the side. Um, it looks so different, it could be a different object if you didn't understand how 3D uh, mapping works. And so we actually don't worry about the 3D mapping part here at all. We actually just treat it as kind of a, a, just a different view of the same object and model it separately or independently. And so now you can see this is the frontal model of the bike. Again, it has some characteristic bike-like structure, if you will, in these regions here. And that becomes our way of describing the bike from different viewpoints. All right, so that's kind of the way we did uh, we do object detection uh, in, kind of in, in recent times. And now we can talk about how to use this exact same model that I just described to identify objects that are be, being used in activities of daily living. And so the basic idea is to uh, you know, apply these deformable part models. But one of the things you notice right away is that uh, these uh, kind of wearable cameras capture video, which is much more realistic than the video we've used in the past in computer vision, I would say. And, and, and one consequence of that is that objects in particular uh, are presented to us in very complex ways. So they're often partially occluded uh, by either other objects or by something else. You can see in the dishwasher example, the, the, the bottom row shows the real world dishwasher, which doesn't look anything like the dishwasher in the unrealistic or staged configuration where we often collect the data sets in the past. Likewise, objects are being used, and when they're used, uh, their, their form actually changes. Their function uh, requires their form to change. And this causes their appearance to change dramatically. And so the, 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 the microwave in the bottom looks very different from the microwave in the top. And there's also motion blur and other artifacts that are making the problem just even harder. So this is really a harder problem. 
Um, another thing that's actually a general problem, which isn't really specific to first-person vision, but hasn't been really addressed adequately right now in the literature, is the issue of the temporal structure. So an activity like making tea really has a very complex temporal structure. You have to start some processes going, like boiling water. Then you can go do other things. Then you've got to come back and then start the activity again. People have actually modeled this structure from an AI point of view using various types of logics, for example. But it turns out that mapping those models onto actual pixel data and video has been very hard. And really, I would say nothing really has been done extremely successfully yet in this area, including the work that, that I'll be showing you and including the, our work that we'll be talking about next time. Um, and, and in the past, we did very simple stage activities and things work much better. A big surprise. All right. So how are we going to model uh, activities then in this sort of object-based world? And the idea here is uh, very straightforward uh, from Pierce Vision Ramanan. Uh, we're going to actually run our object detectors in every frame, uh, find all the objects that we can see, and we're going to build, you can think of this as a histogram of object labels, how many times the different objects appear in, in frames of your video. You're going to do this essentially over video clips that are actually pre-segmented, and then you're going to classify the clips one by one as to whether they're a, one kind of activity or another. And that's how you're going to use object detections to actually recognize activities. So clearly the assumption here is that activities are defined by the objects the person is using. And for activities of daily living, that's actually true uh, to a large extent. But it's not true for all activities that people are, are involved in. So this is, gets us part of the way, but it's not, it's not enough on its own. And then there's this issue that they point out about sometimes objects that are being used are what they call active, and those objects have a different appearance model. We're going to actually get at it what I think is a better way of thinking about that uh, concept when we talk about the work from my lab next time. So I'm going to not really spend a lot of time on this active-passive distinction, except to point out that knowing when objects are being used by a person is really valuable. So then how does the temporal uh, uh, dimension play a role? Well, here what they're doing is they're just organizing the, the video description that I, that I described to you uh, in a kind of multi-scale fashion. Here the multi-scale is over time. So each of these little uh, circles is some kind of bag of objects, if you will, and you can see that they're being aggregated at different temporal scales and that gives us a way to reason about the presence of activity, sorry, the presence of objects in an activity um, in different temporal patterns. So this is not a kind of formal model for the complex structure of activities that I described to you earlier, but it is a feature representation which is better, uh, certainly better than not having any temporal modeling at all. Okay, so that's probably where, where we are now in terms of the state of the art, that we know that there are things that are better than not doing anything at all, but we don't necessarily know what the best thing to do is. All right. So let's put it all together now and show you the result uh, from this work. So this is an example of the data that was collected for the project. Um, this is showing you some of the labels here. So you can see the mug has been labeled, the dish has been labeled, the knife, fork, spoon. Uh, you might ask, uh, why would you say knife, fork, spoon, and not a uh, fork? Um, the answer is that it's hard to tell those three objects apart in the image just because they're really hard. So by kind of putting the labels together, you actually get better performance, and it's still quite useful for telling whether you're eating versus you're doing a load of, of dishes or maybe you're doing the laundry. And then what you can see at the top left is the activity label, which in this case is making cold food a snack. Um, and that's, that distinction is important because if you're making hot food, you're going to use the stove but, or the microwave, but here you're just using the refrigerator. So that lets us leverage those labels to get a better accuracy in recognizing the activity. So you can see that the, the way the labels are being created is actually informed by the experimenter's understanding of the technical challenges of the problem. And that's very common in computer vision and many other AI fields. And I would say it's very important to actually getting anything to work. But again, from an MD2K standpoint, we have to ask, you know, are these boundaries that are created in this context the right boundaries given the health application we actually want to tackle? And that's a very challenging question to answer uh, right now in general. And I think it's a very fruitful area for MD2K to really drive you know, research progress, is this interface between the things that we can do with the technology and the things that must be done in some sense for the applications. All right, so now let's just take a quick look at their data set. They did a nice job putting together a fairly large data set. Um, if you wanted to critique this, you'd say, well, the people are not very many, and they're probably all grad students or grad students' friends. They may not be a representative sample of the U.S. population, for example. But nonetheless, it's a nice data set, and, and, and they were one of the first to produce a large data set, which is really a, a great credit to, the, to them and a benefit to the community. Um, and so I'll just show you now uh, the results for object detection. So this is the same video you saw before. And now the boxes you see are the detected objects. Now this is, a, unfortunately, I got this video from, from them, but it's a little hard to understand. The red and green don't really mean anything. They're just whether the object is active or passive, and that's not really an important distinction. If you can attend to the numbers, then 
Uh, if you think about if the number is greater than 0.4, let's say, then the algorithm is really doing a detection there. If the number you're seeing is less than 0.4, it's probably not going to actually be used by the, by the system in practice. So even though there's a lot of flashing things and it looks like it might be really doing a horrible job, it's actually doing better than you think because most of those numbers are quite low. So the low ones, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, we're going to throw them away probably. You can see the, the mug in the bottom is getting 0 0.3, 0 0.2, et cetera. That's actually being detected pretty well. Um, uh, but you can see the trash can at the bottom sometimes gets detected as a mug. That's a kind of understandable mistake. It kind of does look like a mug if you're not a human. You know, if you're just a computer, it could be a mug actually, a, a giant mug that's far away. Um, so, you know, uh, and you know, now you can see the mug is 0 0.8, 0 0.9. That's actually very good. Um, it, 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 so, so it's getting some of these things actually pretty, pretty, pretty well, although I think everybody, including the authors, would admit it's definitely not, you know, uh, finished by any means. And so really the main point of this finding, I think, is to point out the importance of building models for this first-person scenario specifically. This really is different from things we've done in the past. And one evidence is that the baseline here, which I didn't really describe to you what that is, it's STIP. It's, a, uh, it's basically a kind of very standard feature for recognizing actions and video in the past. It actually was shown to work very well in very simple kind of uh, footage where the, where the nature of the action is in many ways simpler. But in this data set, it does a terrible job. And the data and the model, which just takes care of the objects and organizes them in time, which isn't looking at the hands at all, isn't looking really at the movement of the, of the, of the person at all, um, is actually doing a much better job. Um, and that's because those objects are really important and we can find the object reliably uh, enough to get some signal there. And so chance in this, in this data set, there's 18 categories, so chance performance is around 5%. So 40% is certainly not great, but it is quite a bit better than chance. And, you know, so that's a sign that things are moving in the right direction. All right, and then one more finding is to point out that here the bottom column, bo sorry, the bottom row of this table tells you what the accuracy would be if you use the ideal detector. If humans actually labeled the objects as, from a detection standpoint and just said, here's the object, and the detectors were always right. In that case, the activity recognizer is actually getting 77%. So that tells you two things. It tells you that, you know, that objects are pretty important uh, and useful and that the inability to detect them really reliably is what's holding back this approach right now in some sense. It also tells us that if we could get the objects pretty well, then we're getting actually close to, you know, sort of interesting or plausible performance. I wouldn't say 77% is, is really good enough yet, probably, but it's certainly getting in the realm of being interesting. Um, and so that, I think, is a very positive finding for where we are with this problem. And in fact, uh, as far as I know, this hasn't been redone yet, this, this, this particular data set using deep learning tools. It's quite likely if that were done and if the training were handled properly to deal with the fact that the data set's kind of small, um, this might actually improve things quite a bit. So that would be an open thing that somebody could work on. All right. So that's it for objects, and I want to just move on and, and tell you the story about uh, motion and, and say a bit more about action uh, before we wrap up. Um, but I think the main summary here is that uh, really uh, the object that you're using, the object you're holding, you're touching, you're standing next to even, um, or even looking at, um, that object is really powerful. So if we want to understand what people are doing in their daily lives from this first person point of view with the camera that they're wearing, then we need to have the ability to find the objects and exploit them. And luckily, that's an area where computer vision has made a lot of progress. And I wouldn't say that it's a solved problem or even a commodity technology at this point, but it definitely is a tool that one can begin to use. And I think if we use it in the right way with the right large data sets, it could actually become you know, very effective. Um, the other point to make is that if you don't recognize that first-person viewpoint, first-person video, is a kind of fundamentally different modality. If you just apply ordinary, you know, kind of state-of-the-art for regular video technology, then you're not going to get a very good result. And so we really do need to actually specialize into this area and develop methods that are, that are special purpose for this unique first-person point of view. And I'll have a lot more to say about that, at that aspect next time when I present some of the work that my group has done along these same lines. And I would say that, in general, the performance for activities of daily living is encouraging. I do think that's kind of a sweet spot in the sense that the activities are pretty structured um, because they use so many different objects. They give us a lot of, you know, kind of powerful cues about what's actually going on. So I think this is a, an area where it's worth, you know, making an investment. And then you may think about, well, what if this worked really well? What type of application, let's say, on the health side could you envision if you, if you had this ability to just very reliably find all the objects? And I think that might be worth to, you know, talk about and think about how that might uh, be interesting in terms of applications. All right, so, so the work we've done up to now has been 
really, for the most part, uh, dealing with images as kind of static things. The image arrives, we, we detect it, we might unwarp it and pre-process it in various ways, and then we're just going to analyze that image with, with a series of windows, as I showed you, uh, to find all the objects. So that's really a kind of static process that's not really informed by the temporal dimension of video at all. And, and that's clearly a limitation. So it's clear, for example, that when we're moving in the environment as humans, that the motion of our eyes in the environment provides powerful cues that our, that our brain uses to stabilize our body relative to our, our 3D environment to understand where we are, what we're doing. Um, and so motion is, in fact, a powerful feature, and we need to understand how to use it. And so the first thing is to understand what motion really looks like. So the question is, uh, given a camera in a scene, um, the camera is either moving, which is called ego motion, the camera itself or the person is moving, or maybe the camera is not moving, but there's the scene is dynamic and has lots of motion. Both of those are interesting cases. The basic question is, you know, how does the, how does the visual motion arise in those settings, and then how can we estimate it? And so the first thing to understand is that um, the basics of this are really simple. It's just, again, comes back to geometry. So this is the picture for your eye, where basically there are patterns out in the scene. Um, we can imagine those patterns exist in this kind of two-dimensional landscape. They essentially move in various directions. And then because they're moving, when they project onto the back of your retina, they induce a motion on the retina. And the motion comes directly on the retina, these little arrows in the back of the retina here. Um, they come directly from the fact that there's motion out here in the scene. So another way to say this, and I didn't want to give you all the math, but, but you maybe can understand it, that the same geometry, the same model that projects the points, can also project in some sense the vectors. And so those vectors, in fact, get projected. And so if there's a vector out in the world, whether the vector comes from your eye's movement in, in, relative to a static plane, or whether the vector comes from the eye being still and objects in the plane here moving, either way, motion is induced in the image, and then, sorry, in the video. And then over time, we can then try to analyze that motion and interpret it. And here's how it helps you in daily life. So this is a kind of complicated looking figure because the figure includes all of the, the dimensions of your geometry, so how your head is actually rotating in space. It's got roll pitch yaw uh, rotation in space. And we know from a lot of uh, very early and important work in psychology that that uh, kind of rotation and, and translation of your head in space uh, induces in your retina a flow which is, which is produced by the ground plane. So the ground plane, the ground you're walking on, can be approximated as a plane. It doesn't tend, tend to move relative uh, to you except through your own locomotion. And that uh, induced motion is very important for humans for navigation and control of attitude and all kinds of things that uh, we really are uh, leveraging all the time. Now, uh, there are a lot of reasons why we want to analyze visual motion besides the fact that it's important for walking. Um, it can also be an important artifact to remove, and I'll show you some examples from that next time. Um, it also tells us things about the scene. Even if the camera's not moving, the relative motion of objects in the scene gives us cues about what's going on. So here you can see a ground truth flow field that's been labeled by hand in painstaking detail. And, and, and if you get the accuracy right on the velocities, you can see that the car just leaps out. That car is moving so differently from the rest of the environment that it just leaps out as an object. You don't even know, need to know anything about its appearance except to know its motion, and you can already tell that it's most likely some unique object there in the world that needs to be reckoned with. And you can also tell that it's moving in a certain way. You can even predict that it's likely to hit you based on the flow field alone, okay, which is quite interesting. So suffice it to say that this motion is really important. And the question then is how can we analyze it? And again, there's a, this is a really well-studied problem. I'm not going to be able to do justice to this huge literature. There are sort of two categories of methods. Um, and, and the readings from the Slitsky book really did a good job of describing this, so I encourage you to look at those for more details. Um, there are feature-based methods that involve finding specific points and tracking them. And then, then there are what are called direct methods, which amount to taking blocks of pixels and trying to register them directly by doing pixel-by-pixel -pixel comparisons, um, kind of in similar to the spirit of these detector approaches I was telling you about earlier. And those tend to work quite well um, and are quite robust, particularly when the motion is small, which is truthfully the situation you want to be in if you can most of the time for our applications. So we'll just talk about those methods. So here's the basic idea, and this is an example that uh, cleverly utilizes the, the face of my advisor, Teo Kanade, who was one of the early uh, kind of inventors of this technology, uh, one of his students, Bruce Lucas. Um, and here's the idea. It's a kind of complicated schematic, actually, which I maybe apologize a little bit, but it does show you all the details. So, so here's, two, here's two images of Takeo's face. One is actually uh, kind of the way it should be here. This one's an artificially warped, essentially. And then the question is, can you discover this, tra this transformation here and undo it, essentially aligning uh, the face uh, that you have here with its correct match, the original face that's down here? And this is a bit of an artificial problem, because then you can tell if you do a good job with it. 
But if you can solve for this warp and undo it, then you can actually estimate motion in a very nice way over large classes of scenes. And so the way it works, uh, kind of in a nutshell, is you essentially do a pixel-wise comparison of these two patches. You figure out what is the error down here. Then you go and figure out what are the cues in this image that are useful. You find the gradients again. The gradients come right back again as before. You find ways to figure out how you, how you might warp the gradients to get different kind of outputs. And then you essentially compare the error signal with these gradients to figure out how to change the image to make it better. And so you warp the image a little bit. That gives you a correction. And then you take the image that you're working with and you, and you undo some of the transformation by, by fixing it based on your correction. And then you do it again. So it's an iterative process of iteratively removing the underlying deformation until the two things finally align perfectly. And at that point, you know the transformation that relates them. So uh, skipping over quite a bit of, of literature and, and a lot of uh, you know, time getting the details of these programs really correct, so they're really useful, um, you can just take this as kind of a given right now that this is a technology that exists. You can find it, for example, in OpenCV, which is a kind of very standard open source computer vision toolkit that you probably all know about, Google OpenCV if you don't know about it. Um, and it just sort of works under the, with the caveat that, you know, it's sort of not too much of a deformation and the pattern has enough contrast and, you know, there are some caveats. But for a broad range of, of scenes, it actually works pretty well. All right, so then let's look at what that does for flow. So here you can see an example of uh, Lucas Canade uh, course-defined matching here, giving you a pretty good uh, flow estimate. So the bottom result is, is the algorithm output, and it's pretty close to the ground truth. It's obviously blurred around the edges. That's in part because we're using these windows. We're not doing it uh, kind of at the right scale always. Um, but it's not bad, and it's certainly good enough to use for a variety of things. And so uh, just to wrap up the motion part then, we've talked about how the camera motion in the world induces flow in the image, how things moving in the scene induce different amounts of flow in the image. And then by estimating this flow through matching and warping, we can actually get access to a signal which is very informative about what's going on in the environment. And the signal has been exploited for action recognition, and I want to show you briefly how that was done, and then we'll conclude. Now, this is the result here that is not actually uh, currently on first-person vision. This is some classic result from three years ago um, that shows how to use motion features for ordinary kind of surveillance video, if you will. Um, but I'll show you in the next lecture how we can actually use the same tools to get uh, quite a bit of improvement in dealing with first-person uh, vision as well. And this is actually a case where the kind of the basic story holds in the first-person world the way it does in the third-person world, which is kind of interesting. All right. So, again, I'm going to... Just to avoid this getting too long, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of give you just a, kind of enough detail, hopefully, to understand qualitatively what's going on without really giving you enough detail to implement this. But the paper that I included tells, tells you how to do this, and the code is online along with the data set, so you can really try this on your own if you want to. So here's the basic idea. We, again, build a pyramid, a multiple spatial scales. That's been a kind of common theme in the work. We're essentially going to track uh, sort of regions of these videos over time. We're going to actually tr build fairly long tracks here trying to get some really strong temporal signature of where things are moving in this video. And then we're going to essentially take these tracks and we're going to aggregate them into what you can think of as kind of spatio-temporal features. So the video here is kind of being broken up like a volume. So the XY coordinate of the, of the image plane is this face of the cube here. And the temporal dimension of the video is this dimension here. So this is kind of an XYT or a space-time view of the video. And then we're going to build little, little feature vectors, little descriptors within this uh, spatio-temporal video volume. And these are going to be the input to our recognition process for recognizing what is the action. And here's just a sense of visualization uh, from how these features work. Uh, this is work from Cordelia Schmid, Schmid's group. Um, and I've taken all the slides from her. I'll make sure to, to attribute her when I put them up on the web. Um, but basically, uh, the idea is that we get these fairly good uh, kind of dense tracks. And you can see that they're fairly good, for example, by looking at what's called the motion boundary histogram. This is just kind of telling you where the moving objects are in this video relative to the rest of the scene. So this is a bank kind of, I think it's a bank robbery kind of uh, footage, and probably from a movie. And so you can see this person is moving over here, and that motion is picked out very nicely as relative motion against the background of other things happening in the scene. You get these features in the X and Y direction here. So it becomes a very basic kind of motion feature. Um, and then just kind of skipping over a lot of detail that I'll come back to some of this again next time, uh, one of the things you can do then is you can actually take these trajectories and you can actually kind of break them up. And you can say, what are the parts that come from the objects in the scene, those things that you saw the boundaries of previously, and what are the things that come from the background of the scene? So in this case, the, these little kind of tubes, or, or if you think of them as little lines, squiggly lines, these are little trajectories over the video in time that are being rendered on one frame so you can visualize them. And then the ones that are in white are actually coming from the camera motion. They've been correctly identified as such, and you can kind of segregate them away. So you can kind of remove the things 
that are coming only from the camera motion. And what you're left with then in green are the trajectories, the, the feature uh, motion that's only coming from the individuals or the objects or what have you in, in the scene. So you can kind of separate a bit the background and the foreground, the objects that are likely to be valuable from the things that are less likely to be, to be valuable. And this separation is being done based on, for the most part, the motion. So it's a kind of orthogonal, uh, orthogonal dimension of information than those object detectors that I was talking about earlier. So this is nice. We have kind of multiple ways to decode what's going on in the video and get meaning from the various parts that might be relevant. Um, and you can see it doesn't work perfectly, so they're, they're uh, doing a good job of showing us some failure cases, which is very important in vision to show the failure cases. Um, and so there are failures here that are hard to exactly understand, although if you really dig into it, you can probably figure it out. Um, so again, it's not going to work perfectly, but hopefully from a recognition point of view, it's going to work well enough that the signal then becomes valuable for a classifier to figure out what's going to happen. And many people, including this group, uh, Cordelia's group, are working right now to figure out how to do, do this with deep learning. There's already some findings about reproducing some of these results and trying to extend them with deep learning. So I expect this is going to be an area where there's a lot of progress over the next you know, five years as people really figure out how to use these new tools uh, properly. And yeah, they're telling you here, I just read the bottom here, the failure is due to motion blur. Um, and so that's a common problem, of course, in any kind of uh, video. All right, so this is just showing you the data set that they use. I wanted to give you a sense of what the non-first-person vision data sets look like. This is a very common uh, data set with, with different actions here. You can see them all kind of sampling of different activities, um, kind of randomly sampled in a way. Um, and then there are little clips, essentially. And then there's another one that has long sequences where your job is to segment out the ones that actually are occurring in time. And that's a much harder problem for which we have many fewer uh, good results. And so this is the result from uh, the INRIA group, which is Cordelia Schmidt's group, and they just want to show you in this table that they're the best right now. So their accuracy is the highest of, of all the competing uh, teams. So you notice that the difference is not really huge. Um, it's actually so small you might ask if it's statistically significant or not, and maybe it is. Um, but, but anyway, the point really is that there are a lot of things that are working pretty well on this data set, which is not trivial, but not maybe as hard as the ones we want to work with. So I would, again, take this as a positive finding that, that you know, we're likely to be able to, to make progress here uh, going forward. So we just talked about action recognition, and I've just explained to you that uh, there's this intrinsic motion in the video that comes from the scene projecting into the camera, and that motion is intrinsically useful, uh, and it's been explored a lot in the third-person setting, and it's beginning to be explored in the first-person setting now as well. And however you use it, uh, compensating for ego motion, for camera motion is really important. And luckily, we have the tools to be able to do that now, so that's actually possible. And it seems like using this for recognition is quite promising. Um, but then again, as I said, uh, detecting when things are happening in time, so not having kind of pre-segmented clips, but having a one-hour record of something and trying to pull out those moments when something is happening, that's a detection problem in time. That's much harder, and it's currently open. So to conclude, um, I think there's, uh, it's an exciting time to be working in computer vision. Um, there's a lot of things that are working. Um, very different from my PhD days. Um, and, uh, and as a result of that, we can really start to think very creatively about how these tools might be used to tackle a variety of problems involving video and, let's say, health applications. And so something to think about for next, it's actually not next week, I think it's in two weeks, but uh, the thing we'll do next is we're going to think about how is this first person view really different from third person? What are the differences in more detail? Um, how can we really exploit uh, this camera and the scene motion in a more powerful way than I've showed you so far? And in general, we're going to push farther on uh, activity and action recognition uh, in this first-person setting. Uh, thank you very much. We can open it up for questions now. If um... Let me start off uh, the questions. I think this was an amazing presentation. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Sandra. My pleasure. <clears throat> So, uh, so the first question, uh, I have several questions, so uh, when I see nobody asking, I can ask my questions. So the first question is, uh, how do you abstractly characterize the main challenges in this uh, I mean, computer vision? So uh, I mean, just from what I got out of it was the variability in the appearance of the object, variability in terms of the placement of the object, and then variability in the background itself, then uh, I mean the difficulty in collecting and labeling appropriate data set that represent these various situations, and then validating the method. I'm still talking about the basic computer vision, not yet to the first person vision part of it. Uh, I mean, how would you uh, uh, abstract out the key challenges in this computer vision? Well, so actually, I think you did a great job of listing them just right there. 
Um, and, and, and so really, um, I think, you know, uh, so, so there's, there's a lot of, and it's a great question. I realize I didn't actually put a slide that said, you know, exactly why it's hard, uh, which would be good to do. So I'll think about adding that. But um, anyway, um, so if I kind of decompose what you said, then uh, one of the things that you're talking about is the, what's sometimes called uh, looking for invariance. So um, the things you mentioned, for example, the variability in where an object is positioned, variability in how the object is presented to the camera. So what is the orientation of the object relative to the camera? So my iPhone you know, could be presented to the camera in a variety of orientations. That's a source of variability. If all I care about is recognizing that it's an iPhone and detecting where it is in the image, then that variability is not something that I, that I actually care about. It's just a nuisance. You know, it's a nuisance parameter, if you will, that I've got to handle. So the, the imaging process gives us a variety of these you know, nuisance parameters, the spatial location of things, the orientation of things that we have to be invariant to. Um, and that has historically been a real challenge. Um, and in, in part, that's a challenge because um, those transformations of the object have a big impact on how the object appears. So the real kind of most fundamental variability that's the hardest to get a handle on are the pixel values themselves. So the set of pixels that constitute an object we have this illusion that objects have a very stable, kind of consistent appearance when we look at them. And that illusion is manufactured by your brain at great cost. And this is sort of well known now. Um, and the reality of life is that the, the pixel values, the light intensities in different color channels of those objects in the world that you're experiencing are changing all the time for all kinds of random reasons that are actually quite complex. And so uh, we had a period early in our field's history when we tried to essentially model those complexities using physics and, and different aspects of image formation. And we ultimately sort of gave up because that just didn't really look like it was going to scale. And so the way we've been handling that kind of critical variability now is with data sets. So we just collect lots of examples of objects. And the data sets implicitly cover all of the ways that objects can be presented to a camera. And when we get a big enough data set, we've got enough information about how those objects appear, we can begin to sort of recognize them reliably. So dealing with, with this sort of variance of appearance, variance of position and orientation is definitely one challenge of computer vision. The second challenge I would, I would raise is a little bit more abstract, which is this question of what are the units of meaning. So um, even the notion of an object is not necessarily completely straightforward as a concept. So you can think about in a language the concrete nouns, and those concrete nouns certainly map onto chunks of matter that we should think of as objects. But when people are actually doing things in their daily lives, uh, they may actually be you know, manipulating or conceptualizing objects in a variety of ways. So I think the task that a person is performing really impacts the way they abstractly conceptualize the world they're in. And that produces all kinds of complicated boundaries, if you will, in the appearance space. So uh, anytime someone builds a data set and they say, here are you know, 1,000 categories of objects, those category boundaries are somewhat arbitrary and it's actually very hard to, to figure out what the right thing to do is there in, in, some, in some certain sense. And one example is this finding I mentioned about human level performance. There's a, currently a data set uh, called ImageNet, which is a thousand categories. Um, and one of the sets of categories are different breeds of dogs, for example. There's others, but that's kind of the one major one. And, and then it turns out many people are not very good at that because they don't know breeds of dogs. Like, I don't know breeds of dogs. To me, they're all just dogs. So, so I would get those all wrong. But then the algorithm, given all this laboriously trained data, you know, it learns Schnauzer versus you know, Poodle or whatever, and it's actually doing OK on those categories. And then it fails on things that are really obvious to humans, but on the average, it's actually doing about as good as a human. So, so that's an interesting finding for our field. It got a lot of press recently. I think it's great for our field. But the caveat is that part of the problem there is actually these category boundaries that are sort of arbitrary. So that's a big issue. And I think applications like MD2K can be great for that because that's one way to make these boundaries very principled is to have an underlying you know, kind of uh, clinical meaning or, or protocol that you can use to define what things mean. That may actually be very helpful. That was kind of a long answer, but your question was a good one, so I, I think it's justified. Jim, Jim, hi, Vivek. Very fascinating, uh, kind of getting us very closer to this George Aurelian uh, 1984. <laughs> Right, so, right. so, so, in addition to understanding activity and uh, the environment, uh, any thoughts on being able to predict the intent eventually? Yeah, that's an absolutely great question, and that's that's you, know, if you ask people, you know, like what are you doing and why? 
then that often is in the back of everybody's mind. It's like, in fact, you can make this argument, and it's been made by others. It's not original to me, but you can sort of ask, why is activity recognition interesting? I mean, why do, why do humans do it, for example? Um, and it's actually a pretty good question to ask. And I think the the answer that people kind of accept is that that is the thing that lets you determine intention. So you don't really care what the tiger is doing right now. You care whether in 10 minutes it's going to be eating you or not. And so then you're really focused on that tiger's activity because you need to figure out what you're going to do to anticipate the future scenario that's very negative, you know, for your survival. That's the kind of, you know, I would say party line right now. And so uh, I think that's a, that's, that's a great, you know, problem. And I think there are scenarios like the ones we're in with MB2K where that's a problem we could actually start to work on. Um, it's really hard because obviously intent is hard to get at, and uh, I mean even for humans to get at. Um, and without labeled training data, none of these methods really work well. So if we want to get at intent, we have to actually build databases that capture intent. Um, and as far as I know, uh, no one has really done that on, at the right scale yet to make this a, a tractable problem. But we're very interested interested in that in my group, and actually one of my students has been really thinking about intent, but. We haven't actually done anything there yet, but it's a very interesting problem. I don't hear anybody else asking yet, so I'll ask my second question. <laughs> so, uh, so the problem that we discuss, uh, that you described uh, in response to the first question, that uh, helped with respect to the uh, recall or true positives. What about false positives? So, how do you envision and uh, design the data collection? so as to uh, handle uh, minimization of false positives? Yeah, that's a good question too. So, I mean, um, the kind of, there's, there's some complexity there in terms of what is the right way to think about it. So, one way to think about it, which I don't think is, is what people are doing, certainly not doing all the time, but, but is interesting is to think that, you know, false positives are just your inability to model everything accurately enough to make all the distinctions. So, you know, the reason that you think that the trash can is a cup, one, one possible reason is you just haven't had enough experience with trash cans yet. And once you get enough experience with trash cans, you'll learn those subtle features that make the trash can different from the cup, and you won't make that mistake anymore. So that argument says if you just get enough examples of all the things that, you, that you're ever going to see, then the problem will kind of take care of itself. Now, the argument against that is to say that, well, you know, for humans, a lot of times they're not attending to everything. They're attending to the thing they care about, and they seem to have this ability to kind of focus in on the thing they care about without having to stop and recognize every single object in the scene in order to do their work. So that you can think of all these things that are in the scene that aren't relevant as being like clutter, and then people have this phenomenon of pop-out. They can just find the thing they care about relative to the clutter, and you can, you can argue that they're not doing that by recognizing all the individual pieces of clutter. So it seems like there are processes that are more efficient there. And, and then the question is, you know, how do they work in the brain? And how could we duplicate that in our algorithms? And I don't think the answer for I don't think the story for that is very very good right now. I mean, sometimes you're lucky, and the thing you care about is actually, you know, has some generic features that make it distinctive. So if it really is the foreground object in the scene, it's kind of sticking out in depth from everything else, maybe moving differentially from everything else. That's actually the case a lot of times in these first-person videos, and often it's the case in these third-person videos as well to some extent. And so then those low-level cues can really help you. And certainly your brain is using the motion and the depth that it gets from stereo and from accommodation and so on to, you know, focus its attention on things that are more likely to be important. Um, and so that may be part, that's almost certainly part of the solution. Um, but false positive is really tricky because, uh, you know, there's this question of how much data is enough. It's a very difficult, you know, the thing you don't care about right now is a very difficult concept to model. Um, and so uh, it really is just a hard problem that I think we don't have a great answer for yet. Um, this is, yes, go ahead. hi, my name is Jason from UCLA. So I, I actually have a question. Um, so this entire presentation was about uh, using computer vi vision with just pictures and video. I was just curious, how prevalent is it to do, the, do these kinds of things, but in conjunction with other sensors? And, yeah. and, and yeah. How, how much does that actually improve you guys' predictive ability? That's a great question. Um, and uh, it's a great question to ask today because the, we're at a kind of a, you know, a local high point in terms of the sensors that are available. Um, and it's an interesting question, okay? So I, it, like, like a lot of these things, it depends on your goal. So uh, from an mHealth uh, or MB, MB2K perspective, uh, it's critically important to integrate other sensors because camera alone, no matter how good your vision algorithm is, 
is only giving you a very limited slice of the human you know, perceptual experience, the human life, um, and we definitely need the other slices, you know, the, the online life, the auditory life, et cetera, environment uh, to really, excuse me, to really build a complete portrait. Um, and so that part, I think, is really behind, like it's just really hard to do multimodal stuff and people do it, you know, and it's been around as a problem for a long time, but it's really hard to find fantastic results there. Um, so I think it's just one of these things that's really hard and very domain specific. And so we have to really pick our battles there, I think. But, but certainly in MD2K, we're going to do that. That's absolutely, I think, a given. And I think it's going to be super exciting. Now, another way to answer your question is to say, well, if I just added another sensor, could I make some of these hard problems easier? You know, so you might say, well, you're doing a lot of work, you know, Dr. Ray, to tell where the camera's going. Why don't you just put IMU in there, you know, and measure the, the velocity, the acceleration of the camera directly with another sensor? And that's probably actually a pretty good idea. People had that idea for a long, long time. Um, and when the IMUs were really bad, then a lot of times you integrating it didn't make things better, actually. It just changed the nature of your errors. And it was very frustrating, actually, that, those days. But now if you buy a really good IMU, some, you can buy some expensive IMUs that are super good. And then it really does make a sense to integrate them with vision. So that's a case where people are doing that all the time and that now for autonomous vehicle kind of projects. And we're doing that in my lab as well for some, some vehicle projects. So, so that's a case where the technology has hit kind of a sweet spot where it really makes a lot of sense to integrate in two modalities. But it's been kind of hard in general in vision to make things better. So, you know, people said, oh, we, we have laser scanners. We're going to measure the depth directly. That's going to make everything in vision easier because we're going to have a direct measurement of depth. And I told you that one of the hard parts of vision is you lose the depth. You know, and you think, wow, that's going to really make it. And the problem is that those scanners have their own failure modes. And then what happens, instead of getting, you know, an error-free signal, you get a signal with its own weird, different sources of error that need to be carefully modeled and characterized before you can actually make it work. And so again, you do a lot of work, and, and especially in the past when the sensors were bad, um, you know, it wasn't always actually good. It didn't always make things any better. Um, it just created different classes of problems, you know, so like the depth camera problem versus the intensity camera problem. But again, I'm optimistic that the sensors are getting better, that maybe that's going to become something where, you know, it actually really starts to make a lot of sense. So the Connect, as I'm sure you know, the Connect depth camera and all the related technologies for measuring depth in the depth camera world that's really getting a lot of attention now. That's a huge area of great progress and huge amount of activity. I'm optimistic that might reach a point where you would, you know, look at some of these problems and say, I would never do that without a depth camera because it's just so useful. Okay, I'm, I'm optimistic we might get to that point. But we're definitely not at that point right now, except for maybe really small workspaces where you want to make, make a model of something that's like, you know, two feet around. Maybe in that setting you wouldn't use anything but a depth camera perhaps. But otherwise, that's a very limited part of your life. Otherwise, you, you probably would still want to use a camera, actually. So it's a great question, and it's a kind of very much in flux. But I would say in MD2K, we definitely need to be doing what you're saying, putting camera together with other sensors. Okay, perhaps I can go with my next question uh, while, while others think about it. So, uh, so uh, you know, I mean, th there has been uh, great progress in automated cars. Uh, or the self-driven cars, and a lot of it is by using cameras. So they are able to do a variety of things like recognizing persons and so on, and those cameras are moving too. So, I mean, what can we learn from there or what from there is not transferable to the, to the first-person vision and why? Yeah, that's a great question, one that, one that we're, I'm, I'm very interested in, actually. So, um, so I think the way to think about it is the following, that... Uh, what makes cars, so, so, so I, my take is that, is that exactly what you said is true. Cars are working, I mean, I mean not, sorry, not cars, automated uh, perception technologies for vehicles are working way better than they were in the past. That's actually due to a lot of different sources of progress, actually quite a bit of progress on basic things like optical flow estimation, which is actually a lot better than it was in the past um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but also, again, it comes down to data. So we now have some data sets with, you know, significant number of, 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 of minutes, minutes of video of, of street scenes. And then, of course, the companies that are in this space have way more data that, that you don't really get to see. Um, and, and that is, I think, really driving a lot of the progress. Um, I think that the car space is, uh, is clearly a lot simpler than the first-person vision. You know, the camera in the car is basically translating with the car. It may, you know, rotate and turn when the car turns, but the car's rotation is really smooth and, and kind of simple in comparison to a person. A person can, you know, uh, check their watch, look at a bird in the sky, drop their keys on the ground, bend down, pick them up. 
start running, you know, the, the, the complexity and the variety of human movement and, and the way humans address the scene with their eyes and their head is just way more complicated than any car-based imaging platform that, that anybody has right now. So, so I, I don't think that the car technology will just immediately map on to first-person vision and make things a lot better. Um, what, you have, what you've seen in the literature are a few papers where people are basically kind of putting on a, a head-worn camera and kind of doing their best to walk in a pretty stable, kind of straight line way, like a car would drive, kind of. And then with a few of those data sets, people have shown they can get some results for, you know, ego motion estimation, where did the person go, and so on. Um, but I think we have to really make everything work a lot more robustly um, with respect to the, you know, the camera motion in the scene um, before we can ap approach the car level performance uh, with first person vision. But the data set thing is really important. So, you know, the number of data sets for vehicles uh, is super, is, is way higher right now than the number of data sets for people wearing cameras. And, and uh, that has to change, you know, if we're going to make a big progress. So we're collecting some data sets at Georgia Tech, and other people are as well. But we really, we really have a data set problem right now in this, in this sub-discipline. Yeah, Jim, I have one. Okay, great. Do you see this kind of first-person video, uh, I don't know, data collection camera system as being really a research tool, maybe a medical medical diagnostics tool, or is this something we will eventually see like Fitbit in everyday life with a lot of people? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And of course, you know, the use of Fitbit as an analogy is interesting as well, given that, you know, it's not totally clear how that's working out either. But um, I think it's an interesting question, and I really have no idea. Um, um, you know, uh, there are so many factors that influence uh, whether or not uh, these technologies will be ultimately adopted by some, you know, non-trivial, you know, percentage of people uh, on the planet. Um, I think the safe answer and the easy answer, of course, as you already anticipated in the way you asked the question, is that there are clearly sort of very specific medical domains where having somebody wear a camera is really valuable. And I'll show a small example next time of some work we do with autism where there's a very clear use case and we're getting a lot of traction in the clinical community with the use of these wearable cameras. But it's a therapy setting where it's very structured and so, you know, you're making kids better, that kids have very challenging conditions and you're trying to make them better. So everybody is happy to incorporate some new technology as long as it works and doesn't cost too much. Um, and we may find that in certain health domains that we'll uncover in MD2K a similar kind of you know, trade-off as far as value and, and kind of privacy complexity will, will, be there, will be there. But the big unknown is, 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 is how, you know, people kind of on a large scale think about, you know, uh, imaging their daily life and then uh, their willingness and their desire to share a variety of imaging, uh, you know, outputs with other people. And, and it's, it's, on the one hand, you know, it's very clear, I think it's crystal clear, that imaging has driven social media, you know, it is driving social media. All the innovative, you know, uh, kind of growth in social media companies in the last five years had something to do with imaging, one form or another. You look at, you know, the networks, Cisco and so on, tell us that a huge part of those networks are image, image, you know, data being transmitted and shared. So, so it's very clear that people value, you know, capturing images and sharing them with each other. Um, the question is whether, a, you know, a wearable camera is advantageous relative to an iPhone that you can just pull out or an Android phone you can just pull out and take a picture. Um, that doesn't preclude us from actually, you know, exploiting that kind of data as well. So I think it's this question of what is first-person vision exactly that I'll get at a little bit next time, which is relevant to this also. But I think the broad penetration of that kind of sharing of imagery into the, into the population is just not clear, you know. Um, and there's, a, there's definitely, a, you know, an, an age uh, factor. So, you know, my kids are sharing images of their lives way more frequently than I am. Um, and, 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 and that's, you know, a kind of obvious, you know, thing that people have pointed out. So, so uh, those are just so many unknowns, I would say, that I hesitate to really say anything. You know, we've had some kind of not so successful, you know, attempts like the kind of the, um, you know, Google Glass experiment that didn't succeed in terms of kind of popularizing wearable cameras. And then we have some very successful, you know, things like the GoPro that really has succeeded in, you know, in, in, in enabling people in a, in a very, you know, certain range of circumstances to wear cameras, um, you know, and, and get a lot of value out of wearing cameras. So, so it's a great question. It's one that I, you know, think about often, uh, and we don't really know the answer, but it's very interesting to think about. 
So, uh, I mean, uh, if I compare this M Health world uh, of sensing uh, to the computer vision, it looks to me that computer vision is a lot more advanced or mature as compared to detection of these activities or human states from wearable sensors. So, I mean, uh, from your perspective, are there some general guidelines, abstractions? approaches that have emerged uh, that have been generalizable to detection of various activities from uh, cameras that could potentially be considered or reused or, or uh, investigated in the context of this context is, of this is an Indian, Indian asking a question, right? No, Santosh is the PI, so we're trying to get the... Yeah, I think that's a great, uh, a great question and um... Uh, so I think you can think about it a couple of ways. It's actually funny, you know, the way you ask it, because I almost would say, well, I think you guys are doing a better job than we are. You know, you have, um, you know, variables that are really meaningful, you know, for health, like smoking puff that's super complicated kind of to think about, and then you're detecting the time of first lapse, and it seems to work well. And I don't know, I, it's interesting to think about what's working better. I, I, I guess maybe it's the grass is always greener kind of thing, but... I sometimes look, I mean, I, look, like, I think we look at speech. I mean, the vision community, we look at speech and we think, wow, you know, those guys are so successful. They got Siri, you know, it's like the dream of the field to produce a Siri, you know, early in the day, and now they have a Siri. You know, we have these dreams, but really none of them have been realized yet in vision, I would say, at the same scale. So, so I don't know, maybe, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, hard to assess across, across these boundaries. But um, I, I think there are some things we can learn. I think, uh, you know, I think... Um, I really do think data is king, uh, and, and that takes time. You know, the, the, when, when it's math-based, anybody with math skills can have an idea and, and, you know, get to a paper really fast uh, and have impact, you know, really fast. But when it's data-based, it just takes so much time. You know, you've got to really have a lot of experience with the data. You've got to understand what the data, you know, how to work with the data, how to clean it, how to organize it, how to label it. Um, that makes a huge difference, you know, in practice. The speech guys, you know, definitely learn that. Um, we learned that too, you know, later in vision. We're still learning it now, actually, how to do it really well. Um, and so the data-based work is a tough slog in some sense, but that's the path forward. I mean, it's obvious that's the path to, to get to good performance. Um, and I think maybe one advantage vision has is just it's, it's an old, isn't, relative to computer science or whatever, it's kind of an old field. You know, it really had its origins at the early days of computer science. Because it kind of relates so directly to human experience, and it has this kind of science fiction aspect that's sort of very attractive to students. So it kind of amazes me, especially in the past, that students would do PhDs in computer vision. If you look at how well things are working, you'd ask, you know, do you really want to work on this kind of thing? But, but people always kept coming, you know, and, and, and now, I mean, now it's really working. So then it's really exciting. Um, and I think it just takes time. So I think the, the amount of, I think M Health must be, you know, in contrast, a much younger field. Um, I think once there's more people working on it, um, it's going to go really fast, you know. Um, I mean, I think that it, it, it's really well framed, you know, in comparison to vision. I think it's super well framed. Um, so I would be very optimistic, actually, about M Health, you know, progress. And then as far as methods, I think, you know, the 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 methods that work well for vision are working well for speech. They're working well for NLP. These deep models, they are the thing to use right now. So we should be using them, I think, at some level. They don't need to take over the whole house. But you know, but they need to be there, you know, as part of the, the, the as part of the tools because it's so clear that they're working well, um, we, and it's sort of you know clear why when there's enough data, it's sort of clear why. So at least par partially clear why. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that there's a place where we all we all have some problem, I think, which is in dealing with time. So the the temporal phenomenon is really poorly handled, and the number of methods we have that really are kind of dealing with time as a first class kind of phenomenon and, and really trying to model time or ex reason about time in, in a sophisticated way, we almost never do that. We deal with time by mapping it to another dimension like space and we treat them all as essentially the same uh, in many of the approaches. You know, and maybe a little bit of a strong statement, but, but definitely we aren't doing anything I would say sophisticated with time. And I think that's really a problem. Like, I think it's a problem for MD2K as well. I think time is really important, and it's, it's different from other things that we know how to study. And, and, and even in machine learning, I would say the tools for really handling time, like think about classifying you know, data that evolves in time, I don't think those tools are necessarily very mature either. So, so that's an area where I think everybody has to do more work you know, to figure that out. Um, I wish I had you know, uh, more great ideas about that. Um, and uh, otherwise, you know, just get more data and work work longer. I think it's going to go great. 
Thank you for joining us for, for Introduction to First Person Vision with Dr. James Ray. This concludes our presentation today. Thank you.